All right, so hello and welcome back. So today we're going to take a look at the armchair historian. We're going to do a look at uh, what happened to Japanese soldiers after World War II. Now to preface this, I don't really know a lot about what happened to Japanese prisoners after World War II. I know a little bit about German prisoners, but my guess is after World War II, Japanese prisoners weren't treated very well. I also know a little bit about Japanese culture. Maybe I can add something to this, but we will see. This may not be a video that I add a lot to, but I hope to at least try to do something in it. So if you like that stuff, you know, please like the original videos in the description. If you like this type of content, you know, subscribe, like, otherwise let's get to it. A Japanese soldier stares out the glass of his train car. It has been a long road from the front line back home, but he is thankful to see the end of it. Those final desperate days in the sweltering jungles, the shame of surrendering, his internment by the Americans, all begin to fall away as familiar rooftops come into view. He is finally home. A Japanese soldier stares through the bars of his rolling prison. It has been a long road from the front line to wherever this is, but he is thankful to see the end of it. The sudden invasion by the Soviets, the shame of surrendering, the internment in conditions barely suited to cattle all begin to fall away, replaced by something far worse. He is finally in Siberia. More than likely the gulags. Now, those gulags kept going. They went until after World War II. Um, after the death of Stalin, I think, is when they started to get rid of all of them, finally. So, there's that. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Regular viewers will recall our video on the fates of German soldiers after the Second World War, in which the ultimate destiny of former Axis fighters depended largely on whose custody they came into. The Western Allies, such as the United States and United Kingdom, or the Soviet Union. In one of history's many parallels, the same is true for the war in the Pacific. The fates of Japanese personnel after the war was directly tied to the Allied power they were fighting when the Emperor made his historic broadcast. In this video, we will revisit the topic of Axis soldiers after the Second World War and see the varied and sometimes inhumane fates of the soldiers who fought to dominate Asia. That is a very interesting thing he brought up there. There's, so, the last days of the Reich in Germany in 45, um, the ones that could would flee to the Allies in the West. They would try whatever the hell they could do. A lot of the SS guys that, you know, got out of Berlin tried to make it to American or British lines. They absolutely did not want to get taken by the Russians. If you're SS and taken by the Russians, you're dead. If you're Wehrmacht and taken by the Russians, well... Your, your chances of surviving are not exactly high, let's just put it that way. Um, gulag, Chai, prisoner of war, whatever. They weren't exactly high on the Soviet side. So there are stories of German um, people, units, there were whole units that would try to get to the Allies in the West um, instead of the Soviets. Um, we're talking like run through um, Soviet divisions and try to just make it to Allied lines, or Western Allies, so of the soldiers who fought to dominate Asia. The war between Japan and the Allied powers lasted a total of three years and eight months, from the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and its accompanying Asian blitzkrieg to when the atom bombs fell, though the war in China had been on for some time. Japan's men in- For some time. Depending upon what you want to do, you could technically say World War II started with the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937. You could also say it happened when Japan went into Manchuria in, I believe, 33, because um, they had been fighting China regularly for a very long time before this. Um, again, you, most Western definitions use uh, September 1st, 1939, the invasion of Poland, for the official date of World War II. But again, Japan has been really, really fighting since... Uh, 37 um we the americans just got bombed in, at the end of 41 so really 42 to 45 in uniform did not find out about their country's surrender immediately 
Veteran and Japanese Prime Minister Tomishi Morayama recalled that he and other soldiers heard the news hours after the radio announcement from our superiors. At first, I felt bad that we had lost, but some of us were at the same time relieved because it was a long time coming. While Japanese troops throughout the Pacific region would hear of their country's surrender over the next several weeks. With the end of the war came the American occupation of Japan from August 1945 to May of 1952, a period of almost seven years. J now, this American occupation of Japan was total. Um, it, the treaty, so basically, when the Americans went in there, because the Soviets, the Americans didn't want it, the fucking Soviets there, let's just put it that way, um, after what happened in Germany, there was ice cold relations starting. We weren't going to let them just walk in and take what we had fought for, basically. Um, I believe there were also occupation zones for the British and then other guys, Australians and then Dutch, and I believe the UK and Canada also wanted occupation zones, but we told them to go fuck themselves. Um, because basically we had done most of the heavy lifting, which is true, but we were, did receive significant support from the Australians and they died in Guinea um the indians also fought them in burma everyone really did fight them so we have the trials um with the judges that all happens under the american occupation of, of japan now there's a movie called emperor it is okay retelling of generally events that you should watch its main character it's someone that existed but that whole love story plot shit never happened because he married in a white American woman. It just didn't happen. But the the story of capturing them and just going through the motions of who is a war criminal and all of that happens under the American occupation of Japan, which is completely total. They have no military, completely dismantled. Um, MacArthur does spare the emperor, which is, in my opinion, a good idea, um, to basically stop an entire country going to war again with America, so. Japan functioned as a colony during this period with no military or political independence. All decisions of the neutered Japanese government had to be approved by the United States. This was the world into which demobilized Japanese soldiers returned, if they did at all. Which, <laughs> there's a different culture clashing here with Asians and Western Europeans, which is was at this point basically so when you come home and your entire culture has been uprooted by these americans these white boys um again we have african americans we have asians that were serving but majority of the people that were in actual united states army um and non-segregated you know, everything everything was segregated so white americans so uh, not a, not exactly our defining moment there but you, they uprooted their entire culture and it's been it goes on for years um and it's just a massive culture clash it's like the most shameful thing has happened to like this country no armed military your political offices just don't exist you answer to americans there's a dude called macarthur basically running the whole damn country and it's completely turned on its head the end of the war is usually associated with homecomings and happy reunions. But for the Japanese soldier, the end of the war meant uncertainty, as he made his way back to a homeland he no longer recognized. While the conflict was ongoing, the Japanese government made it extraordinarily difficult for captured soldiers to contact their families. And propagandists in the military pushed the narrative that surrender was as dishonorable as it was impossible. A Japanese soldier was expected to fight to the death, and if for some reason he couldn't, honor demanded he take his own life. To surrender was not only to invite the greatest shame upon yourself, but also to horribly dishonor your family and forfeit one's very identity as Japanese. To spare the and that's something that's not hmm, most of the Allied power. I won't say most. I will say the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, <laughs> um, all the white boys who are fighting them were majority Christian. Now, killing yourself in Christianity is a big no-no. Okay, that's called you can't do that. This is not so in the Code of Bushido. Now, the main problem runs into that. Japan doesn't have a whole bunch of samurai people. 
they did in the early part, but not now. They're all conscripts. They're just regular people that are told to kill themselves. Now, most of us like living, um, but you also have to think that your whole culture is about honor and dishonor. Like even today in Japan, <laughs> you it they're still they're working on this, but just watch some videos. Um, Pablo in Tokyo does some great videos on this. Just watch a few of the their day in their lives. The whole honor thing is still very prevalent there. They don't leave before their boss. They work until 6, 7 p.m., go to bed at 10, wake up, do it all again. Slowly changing with the new generation, but it's that's just how it is. You have to do stuff with your boss. It, it, it's a very completely different culture when it comes to the Western powers that, you know, are going to be imposing a lot of the stuff. And the Japanese government at this time was also still recovering from the fact that they just got their ass destroyed from you know, Western powers. Their families they shame being associated with them. Returning Japanese POWs would often not mention their capture to family and friends, hiding what they were told was the most mortifying, unforgivable sin they had ever committed in their lives. The closest I can put that is a lot of American veterans in World War II did not talk shit about their experience in World War II. Um, it was way later. Eugene Sledge, you know, with um, his book. Um, we got Robert La Robert Lackey for a pillow, a pillow for my helmet that came out way later. These books did not come out in the fifties. They came out in the eighties, nineties. I think earliest was seventies. So these guys are not even our own veterans from World War II in America did not talk really at all um, about World War II until way later in their lives. <laughs> The Western Allies had no interest whatsoever in keeping Japanese POWs on hand. Unlike their German counterparts, the Japanese were not leased out to reconstruct shattered infrastructure or press ganged to clear minefields. The rump Japanese government called for their repatriation and in concert with the Americans had made provisions for getting the demobilized men home. Now, this using of prisoners of war, in my opinion, opinion of German prisoners of war after World War II is absolutely disgraceful by every single power that did it. America did it. Every Western power did it. The argument was that since Nazi Germany doesn't exist, they're not technically prisoners of war. So therefore, none of the rules of the Geneva Convention apply to them, which is just fucked up thinking when you think about it. And yeah, they were used to clearing minefields in Denmark. They were used as POW laborers in France, used for basically all of that shit. Um, especially after the war ended, you shouldn't be doing that. The demobilized men home. Repatriation began in December of 1945, with the sick or wounded, ethnic Taiwanese or Koreans, and all Japanese soldiers in China pushed to the front of the line. The returning soldiers were forced to exchange any foreign money they'd come into for the rapidly crashing yen, but were far more eager to exchange their prison clothes for old uniforms. While they waited for their turn to head home, they were housed in either old barracks or warehouses at their ports of entry, with basic furniture and no protection from the chill of the Japanese winter. Conditions were squalid to the point that one returning soldier noted he wished he'd stay in the Philippines. When it came time for the repatriates to complete their journey, they were given enough money for train fare and enough rations to see them through. The arrival home was not always a happy one. Which was, ba so, before the arrival home, a train ticket and food, it, it basically fucking nothing for the government for these guys. So. Families of POWs sometimes wrongly received notices of death, an intentional distortion on the government's part. So it's easy to imagine the emotional shock of seeing your dead husband, brother, or son walk through the front door. And imagine if you got remarried during that time and they just, because you thought they were dead and they weren't dead. The returning soldiers limped through the streets of their hometowns, often still wearing surplus uniforms given to them by their former captors and sometimes reduced to begging from American troops. Though many Japanese civilians privately supported their returning veterans, the loss of the war and overnight restructuring of their society was too fresh of a wound. 
and some soldiers were greeted with outright hostility by these same crowds that once cheered them as heroes. They came home quietly. That is a theme. Even so, Vietnam, just for American soldiers, was like this, you know, baby killers and all of that shit that happened to our veterans is a fucking disgrace. But it's so. The fact that this happens multiple times in history, it history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. The fact that when you come home and you are defeated and you're just you're not honored at all um, for anything you did by people that didn't fight at all, it, you know, it, it irks <laughs> people. They came home quietly, said Toru Takaya, a high school student at the time. Some of the soldiers told me that when they left to join the war, everyone cheered and sent them off. But when they came back, there was nothing. People looked at them coldly. Regardless of how they were received, it was all too common for returning soldiers to suffer a psychological collapse, and many who made it back to their hometowns simply walked into their homes, closed the door, and were never seen again. The Soviet Union and Japanese Empire had spent the war in a state of armed non-aggression, each eyeing the other while dealing with the pressing matters of Nazi Germany and the United States, respectively. On August 15th, 1945, the Soviets defeated the Kwantung Army in Manchuria, ending their war with Japan. Three days later, Stalin ordered the transfer of all Japanese soldiers to the Soviet Union. POWs were stripped of all of their valuables by the Soviets, left with only the clothes on their backs. They would endure a long journey into the USSR, punctuated by dragging marches between camps, the sight of Japanese women assaulted by Red Army troops, and the jeers and jubilation of the natives at the Japanese defeat. But at the end of it all, they had optimism that they would eventually be returning home. And many were not returned home. They went to the gulags, or basically just slave labor camps where it was. The internees were poorly cared for, as the Soviets put their effort primarily towards stripping their newly acquired territory of anything of value. The nakedly named Committee on Exporting Trophy Equipment from Manchuria oversaw the pilfering of Manchuria and other Japanese territories of anything, regardless of size, that could support the rebuilding of the Soviet economy, leaving and this isn't unique to Manchuria. This happens in East Germany. This happens in basically every country the Soviets were able to take over during World War II. They strip off most of the shit from them to fix the Soviet Union. ...little food or supplies for the POWs. Thanks to the efforts of the Export Committee, huge trains full of loot were soon steaming toward the Soviet Union. Packed in with vast quantities of stolen war material were tens of thousands of Japanese POWs. These supremely unfortunate men were in for a terrible shock, as some believed they were headed back home. Instead, the Soviets took many of their charges to internment camps in Siberia, the infamous wilderness long used to house political prisoners and enemies of the state. Winter set in hard and early, with temperatures dropping well below freezing. Fortunately, the Soviets were careful to equip the transport trains with stoves and heating equipment when they were sent back in 1947. The Japanese who were transported to Siberia battled the elements on their own, with those who touched the metal surfaces of their train cars losing the skin off their hands. And that's when you touch something really cold. You touch metal like that and it, it, it's like air, air cold and your skin, it'll peel right off. Conditions were no better when they arrived at the camps themselves. The extreme cold caused the Japanese soldiers' bodies to go into survival mode, increasing their blood circulation to stave off frostbite. But the increased activity also meant they could barely sleep. When they tried, the men huddled in tangled masses not only to conserve body heat, but because their barracks were often overcrowded. Latrines were separated from the barracks, and if a late-night visit was required, the returning POW would often find that his sleeping spot had been filled in by his fellows. These privations meant that internees required medical attention, and the camp infirmaries were staffed by many female doctors and nurses. 
To the Japanese, this was a humiliation, as the female staff would inspect them from head to toe every month, and shave them to prevent infestations of lice. It must be noted that this was not part of some malevolent design to shame and psychologically wound the POWs, but rather a matter of necessity. The Soviet I'll let him finish for I say the Union had lost over 200,000 male medical personnel in the war, and fully qualified women were available to make up the shortfall. However, these effects were present regardless of intent. Okay, now that's something that's not talked about ever. So, females played a vital part in World War II, especially in the Soviet Union. It is not... It, you will find... You have to dig back, take personal accounts. So from 40... So again, Soviet women were on the front line in World War II, okay? But afterwards, they were expected to go home and... They were not allowed, I mean, basically, to serve in frontline combat units after um, 45, even in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in the Soviet Union, which was supposed to be, you know, equal everyone. It's not. Now, the fact that they mentioned that the medical personnel were women, right? Because, again, 2 million medical personnel for the men's side on the Soviets died. So you only have women. And these women are, you know, highly qualified to do the fucking job. Uh, now, you have to understand something. In Japanese culture... It, <laughs> I'm going to say this very PC-like, women are not equal to men. Shocking. In Japanese society, it is that way. It, it is a societal thing, not a law thing. If you need a recent example of this, <laughs> there was um, a sumo wrestling match. If I remember this correctly, there was a sumo wrestling match. One of the people on the Super Wrestling match, I think it was um, one of the sponsors, collapsed and was having and was dying. So the only person that was trained to do medicine was a woman. She could perform CPR and such. So she went over to help him. And when she did, she had to cross over the sumo mat. Remember, this is today, 2021, 2022, maybe. And then she went over the mat. And then every single man on this... Uh, in the area yelled at her to get off because she's unpure this is this is not something that has gone this is not something that's talked about but just know that japanese men and women are not equal especially back then so when women are treating men it it is just a big disgrace to them basically is what i'm trying to get across so we're present regardless of intent it is important at this moment to make a simple statement. It is a fact of history that the Empire of Japan horribly abused civilians and POWs alike throughout the war, embarking on programs of forced labor, human experimentation, sexual exploitation, and other cruelties petty and expansive. The Everything Unit 731 did is not even just ex exclusive to 731. It's the whole Japanese fucking military that did this. Throwing people off of ships to tie them down so they, they fucking drown in the water. Drag behind rudders, throw them off the ship's keel. Fucking uh, long marches, death marches, just stabbing people because they want them. Beheading. The list goes on and on. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Basically, no one that was on the Allied side really gave a fuck how the POWs were treated. The Japanese POWs were treated. Western, that's different. The Japanese, I mean... It's quid pro quo. You do this to me, I do this to you, kind of thing. This bears no denial. The purpose of this examination is not to paint the Empire of Japan as a victim nation, but to explore the after effects of the Second World War. And it is incumbent on us to report them objectively. The Soviets abused the Japanese as they abused the Germans, as the Japanese abused the Chinese, Filipinos, Malaysians, Vietnamese, Dutch, Americans, British, and so on. And that is all true. It's 100% true. While the camps in Siberia were certainly hellacious, there were internment centers built all around the Soviet Union. The Central Asia regions of the USSR were home to camps that reached sweltering summer temperatures, while some Japanese found themselves imprisoned in the underground wastes of Verkuta. Maybe ask why these camps are just out in the middle of fucking nowhere. Okay, these intern internment camps, just like the Germans used internment camps, and later concentration camps, and death camps. 
These camps serve a purpose. The purpose is resource exploitation of the resources in this area that are deemed vital to the Soviet Union. You have free labor, baba da boopy. Wherever they were imprisoned, the Japanese were expected to do their bit to rebuild the Soviet economy. In the same breath as he ordered the initial internments in Siberia, Stalin ordered that the Japanese POWs be used as laborers to repair the damage they and their Axis partners did to the workers' paradise. The NKVD, the Soviet secret police and precursor to the KGB, was put in charge of dividing the POWs into thousand-man labor battalions. And then I believe it was renamed the MVD in 49, maybe even after Stalin's death. The vast majority of which were used to build roads, lay rail, and construct or repair bridges, and other transport infrastructure. Others were put to work as industrial workers or lumberjacks, whatever would benefit the Soviet economy. The variety and intensity of a POW's labor was a matter of chance. What camp they were imprisoned in, the effect the war had on the surrounding area, how many workers were available, and what would be the most advantageous to Stalin's plans. The conditions of labor were equally varied, with some camps hosting a workforce of relatively healthy internees who finished their tasks by midday, while other camps hosted ill care for men who regularly failed to meet quotas. Though their experiences were diverse, all Japanese POWs shared memories of the work being hard, grueling, and punishing. Japanese soldiers who were in training, or otherwise off the field of battle when surrender was announced, were taken in by the Japanese government, who wished to quickly and efficiently demobilize them. Despite their junior position in the power dynamic, the government in Tokyo pushed to get these men processed, employed, and back to civilian life. American authorities assessed them for what skills they could bring to the post-war country, with those possessing valuable training in civilian trades sent home before others. Skills also determined the amount of rations and other goods the government would issue a demobilized soldier. <coughs> this brings a... There's a different priority on life that people place, depending on many factors. Um, people say that there you can't place a value on a life. I use this example, the 9-11 bill that happened, different people, janitor died, CEO died, different pay for different positions based upon their value to society. This is unsurprising to me government would issue a demobilized soldier. As more and more soldiers came home, the Japanese government steered them toward jobs in the agricultural and industrial sectors, incentivizing businesses to hire returning veterans. Others were enlisted as laborers for the American occupiers, servicing vehicles, and working to rebuild the broken Japanese transport system. The headquarters of the American occupation in Beppu was built with no small amount of demobilized labor, and Japanese workers were a fixture in the building's kitchen. But some Japanese who weren't captured took a different tack. For them, the war was not over. At its height, the Japanese Empire controlled over 20 million square miles, or roughly 51 million square kilometers, of territory. Such expansive holdings naturally meant that news of surrender was slow to reach isolated garrisons and- Also, you to think about this. When Japan surrendered, they still had pretty much everything that is pictured here. Maybe not the Manchuria part. But pretty much everything else they still had under their control. So when there's a holdout, you can understand why. It, to some, it would seem like well, the war is not that bad, right? Like, we still have you know, half, half of uh, Southeast Asia. ...to reach isolated garrisons and positions, especially in the remotest jungles and island groups. Isolated and filled with warrior spirit, some groups of soldiers fought on, either unaware or unheeding of the surrender. One such lone soldier was Corporal Soichi Yokoi, who lived in the jungles of Guam for 28 years as a holdout. When the U.S. retook Guam, Yokoi's regiment was all but annihilated, and he was recorded as one of the dead. He lived in solitude until a pair of fishermen discovered Yokoi checking shrimp traps along a river. 
Yokoi attacked the fishermen and was subdued by the anglers, who, to Yokoi's surprise, took him home and fed him rather than dispatch the lone warrior. Yokoi was ultimately demobilized in 1972 and wrote a book about his years in the jungle. And that's a story you can go watch on YouTube, I believe, for pretty much free. Um, but yeah, this this is just a, a true story. 28 years. And Guam is... I, I know a guy that's from Guam. Guam is fucking tiny. Um, like, you could run the whole island in a day. Not even. It's like 11 miles across. You could run the whole thing in a marathon. A day less. So, it's not that big of an island ultimately demobilized in 1972 and wrote a book about his years in the jungle. But the most famous of these cases was the detachment of Lieutenant Hiro Onoda, whose small group conducted a guerrilla war against the Philippine government until 1974, when the now lone Onoda was coaxed out of hiding and formally relieved of duty by his very much retired commanding officer. I don't know if that was made into a thing, but it might be a little clip you can find. There are... I watched a whole series just on the, the Tokyo Trials. It is... I would highly recommend you watch it. I think it's on Netflix or Amazon. I can't quite remember the name, but if you do, like, Tokyo Trial, you should find it. Um, there was Dutch Judge, Indian Judge, all the judges. Only thing I'll say here that the Indian judge said that we can't actually judge these people because they didn't commit any crimes, that the crimes they are supposedly committing did not exist before this tribunal, and we're using Nuremberg. Because that's what the basically thing was. We're going to use Nuremberg and apply it here. But Nurem but he argued that Nuremberg comes from literally nothing. Um, so he refused to sentence literally anybody and just called this whole thing bullshit. Whether you agree with that or not, that was his stance. I mean, there was no... UN, quote unquote, before there was a League of Nations, but that was a joke. Uh, there was no UN war crime. There was nothing like war crime. None of that existed. And then it just immediately existed. Like the Nazis, the Japanese committed a variety of crimes against humanity that demanded prosecution. War criminals were imprisoned near where they were captured, with jails in Hong Kong, Burma, Singapore, and the Dutch East Indies holding those awaiting trial. The Prisoner of War Information Bureau, or POWIB, was a key participant in preparing for trials in that they actively interfered in the process. Japanese authorities encouraged the POWIB to withhold information from Allied prosecutors a demand the ostensibly neutral body assented to, categorizing their files on POWs and their personal histories as for active release, and release only if required. The situation was further complicated by both the POWIB and Japanese government lacking English-speaking personnel who could interface with the American occupation forces and other allied leaders. I'm basically literally fucking zero Americans spoke Japanese back then. And learning the language, okay. Long story short, Learning the Japanese language, not exactly kosher or really anything any American wanted to do, and vice versa. Same for Japanese, you're learning American English, right? And it's also very hard. I've attempted to do this. Basically, if you learn any other European language, mostly, um, and if you know English, the language I'm speaking right now, and probably what you're listening to, I'm assuming, it is relatively easy to go learn Spanish, French, German, whatever, because we use the same alphabet structure, which means you can actually read the words in front of you. Now, if you try to learn an Asian language that has absolutely no alphabet, Japan, Japanese is one of those. They have a similar alphabet, but it's not. You have to individually learn each letter again, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? If you, Those all transfer to, like, Spanish, for example, which I'm learning right now. Those all transfer. You can basically, I mean, you can sound the word out. It literally has the alphabet in it. You go to Japanese, you're literally looking at, you know, symbols like this and being like, is this A, B, A, B, Z, E? So pretty hard language to learn um so yeah and what he said about you know the japanese war criminals hmm, some of them got off free unit 731 did shouldn't have did and um, many more probably did 
The Potsdam Declaration, which laid out the terms of Japanese surrender, declared, there must be eliminated for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan into embarking on world conquest. And to this end, the Tokyo trials were convened. 28 members of the Japanese government, including military dictator and survivor of a failed suicide attempt, Hideki Tojo, stood trial for a litany of horrors stretching from the time the first Japanese soldiers stepped onto Chinese soil through the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The proceedings lasted until 1948, by which time two defendants died of natural causes. Seven of the 28 were sentenced to death, including the aforementioned Tojo. The 28 at the Tokyo trials were considered Class A, or highly ranking war criminals. Thousands of lesser offenders were tried in municipal courts throughout Allied territories in the Pacific. So, before we just end it here, or oh, keep going a little bit, but every single one of these refused to ever talk about anything that happened to the Emperor. Every single one of them would rather die than condemn the Emperor in any implications that happened. Whether the Emperor was guilty or not, these all men knew. They weren't going to say a goddamn word, and they all died knowing something with the Emperor. Approved of the, of the wars, said something, all of them kept their mouth shut, all of them died to keep that honor. Again, totally different cultures that are clashing. Defenders were tried in municipal courts throughout Allied territories in the Pacific. The Tokyo trials ultimately lasted two times as long as their counterpart in Nuremberg, and were similarly effective in the establishment of international law concerning crimes against humanity. The Empire of Japan entered the Second World War to create a zone of hegemony in Asia, but would leave the war a ruined nation, her soldiers coming home in shame or being shipped off to labor camps in the Soviet Union. Japan would never wage an offensive war again, and would effectively be an American puppet state until 1952. The fallout of Japan's defeat is especially sad. A depressing end to an orgy of violence and hatred with few peers in the journals of man's inhumanity to man. And they mentioned 1952. So if we just take a minute to think about world politics in 1952, um, basically Korea. So the Americans definitely wanted Japanese troops to be in Korea because they wanted us to support. The Constitution of Japan said war doesn't exist as a diplomatic option. So then the Americans are like, okay, we can start doing this Japanese self-defense force again. Basically, America didn't want to pay for occupying Japan anymore, just like we did for West Germany, just like everyone basically didn't. Money was a problem, right? So that's the thing there. And these trials um, lasted until 48 because they wanted to make sure... So Nuremberg in trial in 45, right? Basically, it's over 45, 46, if I remember correctly. It was a very short-ish trial to get these war criminals basically killed. The 40, or sentenced, let's put it that way, not all of them died. And then the 48, um, from 45 to 48 for the Tokyo trial, it dragged on forever. They wanted to pull everything. And the problem was a lot of the Japanese documents were burned at the end of World War II. Germany actually had a lot of theirs you know, available. Um, Japan burned a massive metric ton of them um, to basically save face and save people. Um, but I will look up that video for you, or that... TV show I'll tell you to watch, and then we'll end the video up there. Okay, so it was literally just called Tokyo Try. You can look up on Netflix. I would highly recommend it. It's, again, there's almost no action in it, so if you're like a war person, it's not it. But it, it does a lot of the covering of very vague topics that are not covered a lot on how, like, the justice system is set up now and how they were going to implement it because they, well, a lot of people wanted to use the Nuremberg versus... Um, laws they were just making up, right? It's a very in-depth and nuanced thing, and I'd highly recommend you watch it if you want um, some more context to this video. So, other than that, um, I will see you people later. Got the video playlist up there if you want more armchair historian. Otherwise, I'll see you people later.